Let's go in our Bibles to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians 6, as we continue in our series here in the book of Galatians, really enjoyed this series, Living Life in the Liberty of Christ. And we made our way through almost the entire book of Galatians. I think we'll probably have two more messages here and we'll finish it up. Um, as we've moved into the very practical side of the letter and the difference that Christ and the Spirit makes in our lives. And so what I want to do is uh, as we're going to be in Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 10. I want to read to you just a few verses to set the context for us. And so let me just read these briefly to you. And of course, you can follow along there, but we'll stand once we get to our text. But uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Verse, uh, chapter 5 and verse 13, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And then he teaches on there what living after the flesh looks like and what living after the Spirit looks like. We move into chapter 6, and he begins applying these truths to the ministry of the local church. And so in chapter 6 and verse 1, he says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. Verse 2, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Verse 4, but let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another, for every man shall bear his own burden. Verse 6, let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. And so that's kind of our context here. He's telling them what it looks like when you're living after the spirit in the context of the local church. And so he's going to, in this text this morning, verses 7 through 10, he's really bringing his applications to a conclusion. And then he's going to give one final theological uh, statement before closing his letter. And so I just wanted you to see he's bringing this to a close here as we look at verse 7. So let's stand together as we honor God's word and read in uh, verse number seven. He says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. The title of our message tonight is this, Only sow what you want to grow. Only sow what you want to grow. Let's pray. Father, thank you for another opportunity to look to your word. I pray that you'd bless it, that you'd speak to our hearts, and we'd allow it to change our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. I, I meant to mention, Brother Mark, most of us that are here are familiar with this, but the, uh, the lights are on motion sensors, so those will just shut off if there's no movement for a while. So that's what happened on you. That might happen again during the message, just so you know. When I was in middle school, my family moved to a house in Longmont that had a section in the backyard that was full of gardening beds. And my mom has a, a green thumb, and so she loves planting and, and doing flowers and all those things. And so that spring, we decided, uh, let's plant a garden. Let's put these garden beds here to use. And so I can remember we, we took some watermelon seeds, and we planted those in some little trays, uh, probably in February, early March. And we kept those in the house, in the sunlight, 
to let them get an early start. And so they finally sprouted and it was exciting. And so then we took them out as it got warmer and we went out to the soil and we tilled that soil and carved some rows in it. And we began planting some seeds and we planted those little watermelon sprouts and we planted other things like corn and, and tomatoes and green beans and strawberries and just tried to grow our own crops that summer. And I can remember as a middle school kid, the excitement of it. And every single day I would go out there to see, has this thing sprouted up yet? No, is there a little green shoot there? And day after day, nothing, nothing, nothing. And then finally, the day came, I went out there and I started seeing some little green sprouts coming up out of that soil. And it was an exciting thing. And then by the fall, we had full-blown crops back there. We had corn stalks that had been raided by raccoons and crows. Didn't get that first harvest. We did a scarecrow the next year and it didn't work either. Uh, but then we had some green beans popping up and some tomatoes and some strawberries. And so we, we finally had success and it was harvest time. Can I tell you that when we planted those seeds, we knew exactly what we wanted to grow. It's not like we planted tomatoes and hoped to get apples or that we planted watermelons and we hoped to get squash. I, I don't know why anybody would hope for that, <laughs> but we didn't, we, didn't plant, uh, we didn't plant lettuce and hope to get radish. You know, that's not what it was. We planted exactly what we knew that we wanted. And the reason why is you only sow what you want to grow. Well, the Apostle Paul has been on a journey through this letter to show these Galatian believers uh, that how God works to, uh, apart, apart from the works of the law, let me say it that way, how God works apart from the law to make his people righteous. And the way that he does that is through the death of Jesus Christ and through the work of the Holy Spirit. That's how he makes us righteous. He's taught that the Spirit is totally sufficient to make you righteous if only you would walk in step with him rather than your flesh. He has been teaching here in the chapters 5 and 6 about how the Spirit works in the context of the local church. And now he's concluding his applications with the reminder that what you sow is what you grow. And he wants the Galatian believers to, and this is really his desire, that they would reap fruit that lasts forever. Amen. Eternal fruit. That's his desire. To see them come to a place where in the course of their life, when they come to the end of their life, that they can see spiritual, eternal fruit fruit in their lives. And that's my desire for you as your pastor as well, is that you would grow to the point in your Christian life where your life has been used to the fullest and there is everlasting fruit that goes into eternity. You know, as believers, we want to live a life that counts for eternity. We want to live a life that pleases the Lord, one that makes an eternal difference. That's the kind of life that we want to live. The question is this, how does Paul teach us that we can reap eternal fruit? That's what we want to consider tonight. What he does in these verses is he brings the Galatians' attention to the God-ordained natural law of sowing and reaping. It says in verse number 7, Be not deceived. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. He's concerned here that their thinking is wrong, that they're being led astray into thinking that God is mocked. What does that mean? Well, the word mocked means to turn the nose up at. That's what it literally would mean. And so the idea is this, to look down your nose at somebody with contempt, with, with ridicule. Uh, it, the idea is that, is that you're thinking that you're looking down at God as though his rule doesn't apply to you. That's what it's talking about here. God is not mocked, be not deceived. And so what he's telling them is, is that, when you, that, that, that you can't come to God and say your rule doesn't apply uh, to me. He had just talked about how everybody, we read it, how everybody's going to have to bear his own burden. You might remember that illustration, we're all to bear each other's burdens. You know, Yvonne was up here with the big old suitcase full of books and it was really heavy. We're to help bear those burdens 
And then Noah was over here with the very light backpack because every man's going to have to bear his own burden. The idea there is that you are going to stand account before God for how you bore the burdens of your brothers and sisters in Christ. That's what he's teaching there. You're going to stand before the judge. So that's the context here. And what he's saying is that God is the judge and he's not open for contempt. He's not open for ridicule. He's not open for you to say your rule doesn't apply. No, his rule applies to your life whether you want it to or not. I mean, imagine somebody walking up to the judge bench and telling him, your ruling doesn't apply to me. <laughs> they're going to be held in contempt of court and they're going to be thrown in jail, right? How much more the God of all creation? Amen. And so he says, that's just not going to happen. You might think of a, a kid who snarkishly says, you can't tell me what to do. You're not my dad. You've heard that before. Makes you want to smack some kids around, you know, when they come at you that way. And so you're, you're thinking through. They're saying, I don't have to follow your rules. And what Paul is saying here is you can't do that with God. You can't do that with God. What's the specific rule he's talking about? He says, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Now, they lived in a very agricultural society at that time, and they understood that the seed you sow determines the crop that you end up harvesting. And that's a natural law of agricultural life. But what Paul wants them to know is this law doesn't just apply to agriculture. It doesn't just apply to farmers. No, this is a God-ordained natural law that applies to your life, both physically and also spiritually. I mean, let's think about it for a moment. You earn the money or you get the money according to the hours that you worked. Your, the level of your performance is determined by the level of your practice. The grade on your paper is determined by the quality of your study. And so you can see that, that what you put into it in the early stages will be revealed in the latter stages. I think when we bought our house, we bought it from a track home builder. And, and of course, they're trying to just get those things up and sold and move on to the next one. And so going down the long hallway as you enter our house, you can see the trim kind of goes like this and bows, not that much. That would be really bad. But you can see a clear bow in it. You know, can I tell you, it's not like the trim carpenter said, all right, let's see, how can I bow this trim just so it sticks out from the wall and then I'll cock it, I'll make it look nice, but I'm going to make the trim bow. That's not what happened. It's not like the drywaller went in there and said, okay, let's put some things behind the drywall so we can make the drywall stick and put a bow in this guy's wall. That's not what happened. What happened is the framer. The framer installed some two by sixes that were not straight, or at least he didn't make sure they were plumb, didn't make sure they were square. And so it started back with the framing was messed up. And so then the drywall was messed up and then the trim was messed up. And so what you do in the early stages affects where you end up in the latter stages. What you sow determines what you grow. And that's what, what he's telling them here. And so he says here, for he that soweth, verse eight, for he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. You know what he's saying there? If you spend the majority of your time responding to your flesh, living after the flesh, doing whatever your flesh wants to do, then don't be surprised when the harvest that you reap is very corrupt. Okay? Uh, think about it. You're not going to sow Brussels sprouts and reap strawberries. <laughs> You're not going to sow nasty seed and reap tasty fruit. That's not how it works. You're going to reap precisely what you sow. And so then he says, But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Now understand, he's not talking about salvation here. He's talking to people he knows are believers. What he's doing is he's setting up a comparison and contrast here. That on this one side, he's got the seeds that are sown to the flesh that they're going to bring forth. Uh, they're, going to, they're going to bring forth corruption. This word corruption is the word decay, decompose. It's the word that they use when they were talking about a dead body being in a tomb and decaying away and decomposing. And so the picture that he's painting there is it's going to rot away and it's going to die. But he's saying the seed that you sow to the spirit 
is going to live on and on and on and on, and it will be everlasting. And so what he's doing is he's setting up a contrast here that the seed sown to the flesh will reap death and decomposition, and that which is sown to the spirit will leap uh, will reap life everlasting, that it'll be ongoing for all of eternity. And so what Paul is doing here is he wants them to reap a harvest that will bear fruit forever. He wants them to spend their life investing it in something that's going to outlast it. That's what he wants them to do. And so he takes this law of sowing and reaping and he applies it to them by challenging the Galatians here to sow seeds of spiritual goodness to others. If you look at verse number nine, it says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. You know what he's doing there? He's challenging them to trust the process even when it doesn't seem to be working. He says, so let's not, because you're going to reap what you sow, let's not be weary. That means let's not lose heart. Let's not be discouraged that just because you are sowing seeds to the Spirit and it doesn't seem like it's making any difference in anybody's life, it doesn't seem like, like it's changing your situation, it doesn't seem like you're getting victory, don't lose heart, don't be discouraged in well-doing. He says, in due season, at the right time, the appropriate time, the befitting time. Well, who determines what that time is? God does. And so you can trust in this, that God knows when the right timing is. And so instead of being discouraged, just keep on sowing those seeds to the Spirit. And eventually, in due time, you will reap if you just keep at it, if you don't faint. And so he's really coaching them up here and telling them, don't lose heart keep at it. And he continues to coach them up in verse 10. He says, as we have therefore opportunity, that word opportunity is actually the same exact word translated in due season at the appropriate time. He says, as we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. You know what he's saying when you put these two verses together? There's going to come a time in your life where in sowing the seeds of goodness, you're going to expect this harvest to spring forth. You're going to think this ought to be bearing fruit in my life. This ought to be sprouting by now. I can't believe it's taking so long. What Paul is saying here is you think it's the time for reaping, but God has not said it's the time for reaping. And if it's not the time for reaping, then it is the time for sowing. And so he uses these two words, the same word in these two contexts. He says, just keep sowing those seeds because in due season, at the appropriate time, at the season of reaping, you will reap if you don't faint. And so he says, so as we have opportunity, as we have the right time, let us do good unto all men. Let's sow the seeds of goodness when it's not the time of reaping. That's what he's getting across to them. This is written in the context, really what's going on here is Paul is concluding his thoughts here from chapters 5 and 6 with this exhortation to do good to all men. You'll remember this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, goodness. And so that means that doing good to all men is evidence in your life that you are living after the Spirit that you are sowing the seeds of the Spirit. And so he's, I mean, this is written in this context, as we read, of bearing one another's burdens, of restoring a brother who has fallen. It's written in the context of, of uh, uh, caring for those who minister the Word, as we looked at last week. Let him that is taught in the Word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. And so you can see the overall context here of what he's talking about, that what the Spirit's going to do in your life is he's going to move you to be good to your brothers and sisters in Christ. But now he's saying to all men, but especially to those who are of the household of faith. And so sowing seeds of goodness among God's people will yield eternal fruit when we end up carrying our own pack before God. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. 
thou hast been faithful in a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. That day when we stand before him and, God's, and God examines our life and we're carrying that, that singular burden that's ours to, to bear before God. When you stand before God, it's not going to be somebody else's responsibility over your life. You're going to be responsible over your life. And what Paul has taught is that the, the way that God is going to base his judgment is how you bore your brother and sisters in Christ's burdens. And so now what he's doing is he's saying that if you're going to sow these seeds of goodness, that's going to yield eternal fruit. And so let me summarize what he said here. His message is that the works of the flesh will be destroyed, but the works of the spirit shall last for eternity. And so make sure that you are sowing the seeds or that the seeds you are sowing will produce fruit that lasts for eternity. And so he says, don't grow weary. Don't grow tired of doing good because at the appointed time you will reap that eternal fruit. And so in times when you aren't reaping, just keep sowing. Keep being good to all men. Keep being good to your brothers and sisters in Christ. Keep being good to your pastor. Keep being good to the other people that are in your church. That's what he's talking about here. Doing good to all men is a spiritual seed that is sown where eternal fruit is grown. And so what Paul taught the Galatians here is that they could bear eternal fruit by sowing spiritual seeds. That's what he's told them. You know, in Christ, you've been freed from the power of your flesh to walk in the Spirit. That's a liberty that he has given you. And this text teaches us that there are consequences both to walking after the flesh and walking after the spirit. That if you choose to walk after the flesh, then you are going to bring forth fruit unto corruption. But if you will walk in the spirit, you're going to bring forth fruit that lasts forever. And so he's told us this, that, that the difference between the fruit you grow will be the seed you sow. And so the, the truth that we're supposed to get tonight, and if you write anything down, this is what you need to get, that eternal fruit is grown where spiritual seed is sown. And so let me ask you tonight, where are you sowing your seeds? Where are you uh, sowing them in your life today? Are you sowing to the spirit or are you sowing to the flesh? Because the seed that you sow will be the fruit that you grow. And so let's just consider for a moment, the seeds of anger are going to yield decaying relationships. Marriage is going to be hard. Your relationship with your kids or with your adult children is going to be uh, constantly full of contention and turmoil and struggle if you're responding in the flesh to them. If you tend to be an angry person at work, that means that you're going to be constantly clashing with management and with your coworkers or even with your customers if you tend to go off in an angry fit. The seeds of selfishness will yield to the fruit of lost reward. If you look at your current financial situation and your tendency is to hoard all your money to yourself, we understand frugality, we understand being wise, but understand, if we are hoarding and being frugal to consume it upon our lusts, to get cars, to get TVs, to get game consoles, or in Boulder, bikes, <laughs> if we're just trying to spend all of our money on ourselves, that's sowing seeds to the flesh. If it comes to the place where, where you are more concerned about keeping it to yourself that you refuse to help a brother in need, or you refuse to give a cheeseburger to a homeless person, or if you refuse to give to a love offering to some missionaries that God wants us to help bring on their journey, or if God has clearly spoken and led you to give to a faith promise commitment this Sunday, and you say, no, I'm not going to do that because I've got my own agenda, I've got my own things that I want, and so I'm going to just keep this money to myself. Well, listen, that's sowing seed to the flesh. Let me ask you, Where's all that stuff that you want going to end up anyways? You may get everything that you want if you hoard money or if you go after the next job or you go after the next promotion and you're just constantly wearing yourself out for work and money and work and money. You might get everything that you want, but at the end of your life, you know where it's going to end up? Buried in a landfill. It's going to burn up with the rest of this earth. And imagine the eternal fruit that will be lost as a result. 
That's because of sowing the seeds of selfishness. The seeds of sexual immorality will yield the fruit of lost relationships, broken marriages, ruined children, pain, suffering. It'll yield to the lost membership status with your church. It'll, it'll yield the, the fruit of a lost purity, a lost childhood for young people, and it can even lead to lost freedom. Listen, you can end up behind bars because of one moment of sexual temptation where you gave in and lived after the flesh. The seeds of drunkenness and riotous living will yield the fruit of a delusional mind. It'll yield the fruit of a revoked driver's license, a higher insurance rate, or maybe even the death of an innocent bystander. See, these are all seeds of the flesh and all they reap is corruption. But these seeds of the flesh can actually be traced back even a step further because every single day, what you watch, what you read, who you listen to, the kind of music that you listen to, who you spend your time with, where you spend your time, what you spend your time doing, all of those are sowing seeds in your life that will reap a harvest and mark it down. The harvest of the flesh will always be corruption. And so the challenge is this, only sow what you want to grow. Only sow what you want to grow. So if you want to yield fruit that lasts forever, if you want to do something in your life that actually counts for eternity, you need to be sowing spiritual seeds in your life because eternal fruit is grown where spiritual seeds are sown. Well, how do you sow spiritual seeds? First of all, you got to be saved. Because the reality is, if you never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, then He is not living within you. And the Holy Spirit is not indwelling you and leading and guiding you as the Apostle Paul has taught throughout the book of Galatians. What that means is this. You are utterly helpless to your flesh. You're going to do whatever the flesh wants to do. All you're going to do is sow seed after seed after seed to the flesh, which is going to yield fruit after fruit after fruit of corruption in your life. And so in and of yourself, without the Lord Jesus Christ and without the Holy Spirit, there is no hope for you to yield eternal fruit. But I want to tell you that because Jesus did come and because he did die on that cross and because he paid the price for your sin, you can be freed from your flesh and he will give you the Holy Spirit and then you can have life everlasting and yield fruit everlasting. You can. And so if you've not made that decision to trust Christ as your Savior, that's what you've got to take care of first if you want your life to count for more than this life. If you want to bring that eternal fruit. Second of all, when you get saved and Christ does move in and He does free you from your flesh and He does give you the Holy Spirit, then you have a responsibility to walk in the Spirit so that you will not fulfill the lust of your flesh. That means you walk in step with Him. You do whatever the Spirit says. You say whatever He tells you to say. You go wherever He wants you to go. You stop doing whatever He says stop doing. And you start doing whatever He says start doing. You live after the Spirit. And what will happen is you'll listen, you'll obey, and you'll reap the fruit. But there may be times in your life when after trying everything that you can, to sow seeds to the Spirit. And you're sowing those good seeds at work. And you're sowing those good seeds with your family at home. And you're sowing those good seeds with your lost family over the holidays. And you're sowing those seeds among your neighbors and among your friends and even the lost people that you might live with. You're sowing those seeds and you're just thinking it's not making any difference. I'm not seeing any fruit. It's at those times that you can get discouraged. You can lose heart, as the Apostle Paul said. But I want to remind you of this, that just because you think it's time to reap doesn't mean God thinks it's time to reap. Amen. And in those times of life when you're not reaping, trust the process. Just keep sowing. If it's not the time for reaping, it's the time for sowing. And you need to sow those good seeds to the Spirit. And Paul has given us some spiritual seeds to sow and they're centered around doing good to all men 
but especially to those who are the household of faith. In this context, he's saying that we ought to be careful to restore those who've fallen. Spiritual seed of goodness is being forgiving to people who've messed up, being forgiving to people who've hurt you and done you wrong. We ought to be bearing one another's burdens. We ought to be doing our part to partner financially with and to care for the needs of missionaries and preachers who faithfully minister the word. We ought to be actively looking for ways to sow spiritual seeds of goodness to our brothers and sisters in Christ. And so it might be that you're made aware of a specific need, that somebody needs some help moving, or maybe somebody needs a, a meal prepared for them because they're in, in a time of pain and suffering or maybe financial struggle. And you, you're hearing about these, these needs that we ought to just jump right in and help bear that burden for them. That's sowing a seed of goodness that will reap an eternal harvest. Sunday is an opportunity to sow some good seeds. We've got these missionary families coming in, and I know they're going to be a blessing. And they've got cute little kids. They both have a one-year-old and either an almost three-year-old or a just-turned three-year-old. And I'm excited to have some kids running around the church on Sunday, and I hope they get in trouble so it's not my kids for once. <laughs> but I'm uh, looking forward to having these missionaries with us. And you know what? I've talked about this last week, so I'm not going to belabor the point, but they're going to have some travel needs and you have an opportunity to contribute to a free will love offering to be able to help them uh, get their car down the road with some gas. You might be able to get them a gallon of gas, you know, put five bucks in the offering, uh, but you can help out with their food in the next journey or with a hotel stay in the next journey, just by contributing even a little bit of what you have to to that love offering on Sunday and we have an opportunity to have an even bigger part in their lives as we receive our faith promise missions partnership commitment as we partner financially with these missionaries to care for their needs on a monthly basis to be involved in their ministry and only time will tell the eternal fruit that's yielded from that spiritual seed that's sown only time will tell Jesus sowed his spiritual seeds of goodness. How did he do that? When he gave his life on the cross for our sin. That was a measure of his goodness in our lives. He shed his blood, suffered in painful agony for us. But you know what he's doing in heaven now? As souls are saved, he is reaping an eternal harvest of a new nation of believers. And now he's asking us to follow in his steps and continue sowing those seeds of goodness. So eternal fruit is grown where spiritual seed is sown. So let's make sure that we only sow what we really want to grow. Father, thank you for this truth in your word. And I'm encouraged by what it, what it gives us. That it's real with us. That there are going to be times when we're going to lose heart. When, when walking in the spirit and sowing those seeds of goodness is not easy. When it doesn't seem like it makes sense because we're not reaping and it feels like we should be reaping. can't imagine what Jesus felt like as he was rejected and beaten by those he called, those he desired to save. And yet he endured the cross, despising the shame. And now he sat down at the right hand of God, reaping the eternal harvest. And God, I thank you that we can be encouraged to trust the process, to walk in the Spirit so we won't fulfill the flesh. And I, I pray my desire for your people is to bear as much eternal fruit as possible. Help us tonight to see that that will only happen if we sow spiritual seeds of goodness to all men to those in our community, but especially 
to one another. Help us as a church to be a loving church that cares for each other, that sows those spiritual seeds and meets each other's needs. And I pray that Sunday as we have our missionaries come in, that we would jump on board at the opportunity to have a part in their ministry. And I pray that our part in their ministry as they go over the seas to London and to Germany, and as souls are saved, that that'll be fruit that abounds to our accounts, that you would help us to bear eternal fruit as we sow these spiritual seeds. I pray if there's anyone under the sound of my voice that's not trusted Christ as their Savior, that they'd make that decision tonight and be freed from their flesh and be gifted with the Holy Spirit to help make them righteous. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.